Hi everybody, Professor Gassimi here, and in this component of the lecture, we will be speaking about sizing with CSS. As always, I do encourage you to take a look at some of the readings for the class where you can get uh, the supporting content used to create a lot of the lecture that you see here today, as well as some great exercises. So for most of what we've done in the class so far, I have intentionally been using absolute values for size. So for example, if I wanted to set the width and the height of an image, I would take the width property and I would set it to, let's say 500 pixels. I would take the height property and I'd also set it to 500 pixels or something like that. But for a lot of the work that you're doing in CSS, particularly to maintain the uh, quality of the viewing content in a variety of displays, uh, window sizes, mobile devices, non-mobile devices, etc. relative units of length are something that you will oftentimes want to use. And the thing about any relative unit is that it depends on what it's relative to. So I've listed all the relative units here that exist within CSS. I don't think you need to know all of these for the purpose of the class, but there is a, a couple of them I want to highlight. The first is the EM unit. What this does is it will set the size of something relative to the size of its parent. It's typically used when you're setting the size of a font, as an example. Um, there's also REM, not EM, but REM, which sets the font size relative to the root element in HTML. So not the immediate parent, but the root element, the body, as an example. Okay, And then the other ones that I want to highlight here are VW and VH which stands for view window or view width and view height respectively. Now, these units are between 1 and 100. And 1 would represent, for example, 1% of your viewport's width. A viewport here is the size of your, your browser's window. So you know, if I have my browser open, I can take it and I can stretch it, make it half of my total monitor size. I can make it a third of the size and so on. The view W there means that I want to set uh, a unit of size that is proportional to 1% of whatever dynamically the size of the browser's viewport window is in that moment. The same goes for view height. You have within view width and view height an ability to set a uh, something called a vmin, which is I'm going to look at both view width and view height and take um, the smaller of those two, 1% of the smaller of those two, and then Vmax, which is I'm going to look at these two and then take 1% of whichever the two is larger for setting a size. So the view width and the view height are really useful, in my opinion, for dynamically sizing text, dynamically sizing images. The EM and the REM can also be really useful for dynamically sizing text. OK, so when we speak about sizing, there's a couple of things I want to note here. The first thing is that some elements in HTML have a natural size, meaning that if you don't specify a width or a height, they, they will take on that natural size. So for example, if you uh, wanted to import an image, star.png, well, that image, when you import it, it has a certain number of pixels in height and a certain number of pixels in width. So even if you say nothing in the style sheet that I'm showing in the middle here, you're still going to get an image that's a particular size uh, and has a width and a height and so on. Now, there are other elements in HTML that, that don't necessarily have a natural size, like a div. A div is just flat, as you're seeing here. I'm showing the border here just so that you can actually appreciate that there's, there's nothing in the div. Okay, It doesn't have a natural size the way an image does. Now, when a size is given to an element, we refer to that as the in extrinsic size as opposed to the natural size. So meaning I can come to, for example, a, uh, a box class, and I can give it a static height and a static width, just like in the case of the overflow example we saw earlier. Right? When you do this, you're sort of nailing the sizes here down. When you don't do that, if you don't give a specific height or width, 
usually the document is smart enough to figure out that it might want to adjust these border sizes uh, because you didn't extrinsically size them. If you give the child box or the child element, for instance, within a nested structure, a percentage of width, it will be a percentage that is with respect to the parent container. Okay, so for example, if we have a, a box class here and I say I want the border to be five pixels and I want the width to be 50%, this width of 50% is with respect to the parent of that class. We can also ask CSS to give an element a minimum and a maximum size. So coming back to that overflow example, we can come here and we can say that we want the minimum height to be 150 pixels as opposed to the height. And then what happens is this content now expands, as you see on the right hand side, because we didn't extrinsically pin down the minimum. We can do the same thing for the maximum size as well. Setting the min and the max sizes, whether that's with the height or the width, is useful usually when you're trying to move from um, mobile content to non-mobile content views in some circumstances uh, when you want to keep uh, images at least a certain number of size or at least a certain number of pixels in size as an example.